<clears throat> hey guys, welcome to episode 71 of the Jungle Brothers podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Joey, host Paulie and T in the house. How are you? Hi. Yeah, good. Yeah, real good. How are you guys I'm doing? I'm happy for you to be the host. Well, it like kind of, I didn't want it to sound like it's my show and then we've got the guys in again because right. they're always fucking hanging around on my show. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get rid of them. Um, we just looked at our stats and we had a uh, thousand people listen to our podcast last month, which um, that's pretty cool. We're pretty proud about that. A thousand people. 250 a week. That's crazy. 250 an episode kind of thing. Mm. It's nice. It's slightly more than our members. It means there's a handful of people outside of the members of the gym who are listening. So thank you guys for listening. We appreciate it. It amazes me when I see those stats. How so? Oh, you just don't, you don't look at them very often and you think, you know, you're just speaking to a small group or there's no one listening to listen to and it's just a bit of therapy for the three of us on yeah. a Friday. It's true. <laughs> it I don't is. want to listen to you guys. I love listening to me. I do it me. I have to. It's, it's a, you guys are on the show, so I'll listen to you. To work. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking about the film industry today and for some of you folks out there, you might not understand why. Uh, it's because Paul T and I all came from the film industry. That was where, uh, that was where we met T, you and I, and Paul and T. Paul and I knew each other prior, but that was where we did a large part of our work through our twenties. And so there's some interesting things in that. And so the topic of today's show is three lessons that we each learned from the film industry, and we've supposed to have written down our lessons separately, and then we brought them here to the show today, and we're going to talk about it. Thought maybe one of you guys could take us on a little walk down memory lane, give the folks a bit of context about what we used to do before we became these, you know, <clears throat> stalwarts of the gym game. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, we, we all worked in that industry for a long time. Um, it, I think we all worked for, in there for over 10 years, different times. I was there kind of the longest. I was the last one to leave. Um, yeah, we, we, we did lighting. We're in the lighting department, so we were behind the camera technical stuff really we uh we set up lights we worked with the the director of photography um to help them realize the dream of the director and tell the story um a lot of the time we spent uh in the commercial industry making tv commercials or on tv shows making you know dramas um and then film dramas dramas that you may have watched dramas that you might have worked on home and away might have worked True. on uh, what other fucking shows? I have forgotten so much. You'd have to remind it's, it's me. It's amazing the amount of shit we worked on. I've that done you a just lot. Do not remember now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's rattle off maybe some of the films. Um, yes. Wolverine. Wolverine. Several Wolverines. The Wolverines. The one. The Japan one. You worked on Matrix. Ah, uh, when I finished school, I did some time on it. But a time on that. That Star Wars. Like Star Wars Episode Three. I was there when. Um, and I'm not even a huge Star Wars fan. It was like an education for me, but it, I think it was a very, um, it was a lockdown shoot. That whole thing was high security because it's the one that joins the first three. It's horrible. It was, yeah, it was ep three. Oh, horrible, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Giving you guys a little yeah. hint on the tone of horrible. today's yeah. episode. <laughs> so yeah, I was there when, you know, um, Darth Vader rises up as Darth Vader and we, we shot all that stuff. Sick. All in Fox Studios. What else? What else? Great Gatsby? Great Gatsby. Line the Witch in the Wardrobe. Line the Witch in the Wardrobe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, no, I didn't work on that. Nothing, nothing that you'd really... It's funny because you end up working on the projects that are local to Moulin you. Moulin Rouge. And we're in a, Moulin yeah, Rouge. We're a small industry yeah. in Australia, so, you know. Stealth. They're not, they're that not was, films. Yeah. That, Stealth? Stealth. Cult, cult oh, classic. my God. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen Stealth, you can probably... they probably give it to you for free if you go to Big W. <laughs> it's just by the checkout. Uh, yes. Superman. Superman Returns. Yeah. That was a beauty. Superman Return. Was it X Men? No, it was Wolverine. Yeah, Gods of Egypt. Gods, Gods of oh Egypt. God. You did that. Yeah. So we um, we were like, if you if you've ever watched credits, we were in the lighting department, as Paul said, and the the you have what do we have? You have the best boy and you have the gaffer, mm. who are the head. The, the gaffer is the head of that department, mm -hmm. and then the best boy is his second in charge. Mm -hmm. So we each kind of you guys you guys did a lot of best boying roles, did you not? Yeah, I did. Um, but not on the big, not on the big films. It's more for uh, one other gaffer, uh, the guy who got me my my first gig, and that was Rick McMullen. Um, shout out, absolute champ. <laughs> shout out, Rick. You know, bit of a rogue, but just such a yeah, lovely man, and he taught me a lot mm. about life in general. So I got a lot to owe to that guy. Yeah, um, but yeah, I was best boying him for for him for a while, but working under his best boy originally, and then I ended up with that role. For some time, and then after that went a bit rogue, 
and started floating around with you guys on the big gigs. And the big gigs. Yeah. Right, we let him in. We let him into the inner <laughs> sanctum. <up> lodge. Yeah. <laughs> to, the fucking, <laughs> to the machine. Yeah. Straight to the coffee machine. Yes. Bring <laughs> everyone up to date with what was happening out in the real world. Yeah. Yes. Because it gets to become, it becomes a little bubble, doesn't it? The big films. Yeah. Oh, 14 hour days. Horrendous. 16 hour days. That's, yeah. You're, touching on, you're days. touching on one of my greatest lessons. Can't leave the location. You eat there. You sleep. You're almost sleeping there. You, may, you, well, get, you, one do, you day, sleep you get there. one day off, but not always. And that Sometimes you got to work the just, Sunday. Yeah, you're just trying to recover. You spent. Yeah. Especially because you fucking got on it the night before with it's, everyone. Yeah, it's hard work. <sighs> fucking hard gig. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. So there's, there's different uh, little spheres inside the film industry here in Sydney. There's the commercial realm. Just to paint a little bit more of a picture for listeners. Paint it for them. The commercial realm, people making commercials, and they're often, you know, short projects. The shoot days themselves are, are, long, are only long. one to, to one week long, kind of, you know, yeah. that's on the rarer side, but they're usually a couple of days. And a lot of prep hours. goes into them. And they're long hours. Yeah. And then you get the TV dramas and the shows, they would, they you know, they go season to season and they might be 10 to 12 weeks or something like that. And, and that's like five days shoot, a week. Shoot, 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 shoot. And they're very quick and they don't have as much money as the bigger budget films, which are anywhere from, you know, three to six months long. And there's and a lot of money hours, in those and heaps those. of people. Yeah. And then, and then they have five to six day weeks. Uh, so yeah. there's these different projects, different sizes. And you asked about roles. Your roles might change. So you might, you know, be a best boy, that two I see on a commercial, but you'll work happily on a film and, and just be one of the technicians on the floor type thing. So, yeah, it's just different. there's different scenes and um, they cross over a lot. And a lot of different departments within, within, within yeah, that, that's that, right. that set. You've got art department, lighting department, uh, you've got uh, camera department, you've got uh, production. Grips. Costume, makeup. Costume, makeup, actors and all that kind of jazz. Heaps of shit. Yeah. And it's funny because you end up with these Props. stereotypes in each department, which are really quite, <laughs> quite accurate. <laughs> it's like, on. You could say that the lighting department is like a bit of a teamster, like generally a bit, bit blokey, bit teamster-ish. But compared to the grips, we're not that team star. Whereas the grip department are like, they're super team star. They're like super blokey. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Lighting sure. department's definitely yeah. the phys- physically the fittest. Have the most amount of gear to lug and the load. Bit of bias and, there. And move. Oh, for but sure. Yeah, they were. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Light, lighting and grip up there. Yeah, grip mm. not so much, I don't think, to be honest. Big call. Well- Depends you on look the at job. The, the amount of gear. Oh, well, yeah, it does. I mean, if there's a crane that comes out and they have to f- lift a few. Yeah, but they get more technicians Then they get like in. 20 guys <laughs> yeah. in. Well, that's it. Get yeah. a little, little line going. Uh, but no, definitely. I mean, when I first start, started, the, the kit was heavy. Like, it's getting lighter now because technology is allowing more light to come out of smaller heads, you know, with all the LED technology and shit. But that's and weaker. That, that, lighting when I first started, the kit was. <laughs> Really heavy. heavy, yeah. Sixty yeah. kilo heads and thirty the kilo cables. Go with it, the and cables. And so that mm. T's talking about like a, an actual light that is sixty kilos, and so you think, all right, you got a light that's sixty kilos, so it's got to go onto a mount like a stand. So a stand that can hold a sixty yeah. kilo light, the stand's got to be of equal weight almost, mm. sometimes mm. more, mm-hmm. yeah. and a huge piece of fucking metal and shit and wheels and all sorts Cranks of stuff. And, yeah. But that's then you think about the amount of power that's required to run a light like that, mm. which is, what are we talking, like an 18K, 18,000 watts? Yeah. So then it's like huge power cables. The power cables weigh collectively, you know, you've got a couple of power cables, they're going to be, I don't know what they are, like 50 kilos each? Maybe not, Maybe or not. Dip depending. But, but if like you have to run, you, you might be running run a ton of cable, of it. Yeah. you know, or, or more, mm. just so to it, get a light out to a fucking middle of a paddock. Yeah. So it's some heavy shit. Yeah. And so we t- roll in with big trucks and we roll loads of gear out. And tons the, of. You know, and you think in 60 kilos, a lot of people are, ah, oh, 60 kilos, yeah, I can, I can lift that, you know, on a bar or even above <laughs> the head, but it's not the same when it's round and it's top heavy and you have to lift that 60 kilos and ha- get the spigot to fit into a tiny little hole on while shot, yeah. it's above, like right above your head and you're balancing on. Yeah, a couple of little and you can't dump legs. it like you can dump a barbell. No. <laughs> it's worth more than your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, so it's it's, it's a it's a hugely physical job. Yeah, mm. 
Um, which reminds me when I first met T and did some work with you guys, your crew was known, were known as the Chippendales. They were. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for obvious reasons. Who <laughs> <laughs> wasn't you? Peaches? Ste- yeah, Peach. <laughs> he likes to think that he wasn't part of the crew because he thinks that he's like the solo guy, but he was definitely one of us. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was Alex. And that was, and Pete had his leg broken at the time when we got the So it was me, Alex, and, and uh, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Young guys. <laughs> all wearing Young boardies. Al. Yeah. Yeah, all wearing boardies. Yep. All wearing boardies. Yeah. And ankle and, socks. And Brooks. And Brooks. <laughs> 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 Brooks beasts, those little clubs that you have on your feet, plodding along. Yeah. So where did it um so where did it where did it start for you? How'd you get into the thing? My dad got me in. Uh he met a guy uh who was the best boy for Rick. Um and my father was working in a restaurant at the time and then um I think someone didn't turn up for what, what they, they couldn't find anyone for the day and my dad and I was doing my pe- I was doing my cert for and um my dad said hey um called me up and he said hey there's a there's someone didn't turn up not turning up for work tomorrow and there's a lighting guy for film and I'm like I don't know anything about film or lighting I'm, I want to be a PT and, and he's like yeah but you can get on there and meet like actors and and stuff and maybe get some some good leads and I was like oh it's a great idea 10 years later I'm <laughs> still in the lighting department yeah. that's pretty much how it happened wow but that first job was it went for 20 it went it was supposed to be an 8 hour gig and it went for 20 hours uh, and I, I got through the the first 8 hours Jesus. with Rick and they were strung out there was gear everywhere we were under star, under man it was uh, horrible and um and he said, look, man, just, just go home because I, I can't actually afford to pay you for any more extra hours and, um, you know, we'll, we'll sort it out, which you, you do in the industry. And I was just like, I can't leave now. That's a horrible thing to do. So I hung out, uh, hung out to the end and then Rick called me the next day and said, look, um, I'd really love to have you on as a full-timer. I don't have any money to give you, but if you can help me get my business back on track – then there's opportunity for you or there's opportunity for friends or anyone else who you think who, you know, would like this industry. And I had a lot at that time, a lot of mates that uh, were mechanics, uh, auto electricians, you know, one mm, that was mm. just got, got out of jail and none of them were happy in their gig. And I thought, wow, this is like a much better place to be. And, you know, in retrospect, it is. Um, the money was great. And also the travel and freedom of film and the people much nicer to work around than in a workshop. Um, you you were do, you were also doing workshop stuff. I had I or would, or no. Like? I lasted six months mm. as an auto electrician. Okay, my hands didn't like being in tight crevices and your, your big mitts. Yeah, I used to get the <laughs> barely screw a cap on the bo- onto <laughs> a bottle. Ter- I was so <laughs> bad at it. I was an absolute waste of time <laughs> in that space, and I kept getting told, and I was like, "No, nah, I'm going to stick it through." And I did that for about a couple of months, and then realizing that. I was, they're right. They're all right. I'm <laughs> shit at this. I'm <laughs> getting out. So I got out. But my two of my closest friends stayed in the industry, like uh, in the automotive. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, there was opportunity there. And I thought, all right, I've got the opportunity to firstly see if I can get a business up and running again, um, get my boss off the, the drugs that he was on. He was doing drugs at the time and get him fit. Uh, and so I could use him as a as my um, my my uh, client my client yeah for pr- my yep. my for my prac yeah and um and I did and uh, we managed to get him in a really good place and he was kind of like it was it wasn't like he wasn't like a druggie or he wasn't a junkie I should say but he he had a, um he definitely there was an addiction there and we we kicked it so that's cool and then, I uh, didn't know that yeah and then and then he just started handing over the runnings of the business to me on the, on the shop front side of things. And he would always take care of production, but I hung out with him a lot. Like we'd go visit production companies um, and he would just turn up with some bread and some flowers and, and he'd network and such a character. Yeah, he was very good at He's like amazing at that stuff, keeping really good relationships <clears throat> with the people around him. I learned a lot from him over that time. Um, probably a lot of that comes from where, where I kind of play my role here at JB's to be honest. Wow. Cause I remember you asking me that same question. I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I think 
Uh, yeah, definitely a lot of that came from just hanging out with Rick. How cool. Yeah. Yeah, it sound, sounds like a lot of it has. Yeah, <laughs> and then from there we got, uh, there was Steve, Alex, my dad, Will, um, a whole line of friends and family that kind of came through the industry after that and made a good living and got out of um, the, the jobs that they were in and some of them are still there today. Just I was loving Killing it. Killing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, doing really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. totally. Yeah. Loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> loving it. I do. Even when I sit down with them, they're just talking film the whole time. I'm like, fucking, oh, man. Well, obviously, we three of us have left since then, so we'll get to that part, I right, suppose. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, for, for different reasons. What's your origin story, Polly? Uh, uh, well, I had already, when I finished school, I had two of my older siblings already in the industry, Moses, um, he was uh, like a, a working best boy and all the kind of American big films that were going on at the time, Matrix you mentioned and Mission Impossible 2 and stuff. So I was doing like work experience on that stuff when I was in year 11. Um, so, uh, and then I had Betty who was, you know, she started um, in the industry in the uh, director's department um, already. So I kind of had that there. Um, so when I left school, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I deferred uni for the first year um, and, I, and I was bodyboarding and hanging out and going on a few surf trips with like the, the boys, you know, and um, I wasn't really doing that much. And it was like January, February after school, direct the year after I finished school. And um, Mo rang me and he was in on a film in far north Queensland in Port Douglas and parts of it went into the south of the Daintree and stuff like that. And he rang me up and was like, oh, uh, what are you What are you doing for the next few weeks? And I was like, nothing. He said, Oh, why don't you Why don't you come up here and and I'll fly you up. Um, you can stay with me. I got a huge villa. Um, we got no money for you, but we'll pay you in in food and booze and just come and hang out. <laughs> it's like it's heaps fun. And I was like, Yeah, okay. So he flew me up and basically like for the fifteen to seventeen years I worked in the film industry, it was probably like the one one of the top three experiences I've ever had in film was like that first, it was two to four weeks. and thinker. It was, yeah, I was, I was in. It was like, they took me out every single night, every single night. And I was working up there with uh, Paul Booth and Ting and G-Man and we were like in the most, G-Man. most beautiful locations with an awesome crew. And, um, and yeah, I just had the time of my life up there. And I remember, uh, like I, I know now, or I knew a few years later um, why he brought me up there was because they were completely undermanned and he, they just needed more labour and they, they got me in there and I, they just chucked me in the middle of a bamboo forest and said, run this power lock from here to there. And they just had me doing anything. And I'm like full of beans. I'm like, yeah, yeah, do whatever. I was just like ripping around. And at the end of it, they, they hassled the producer to like give me some money and so I had that whole sick experience, some really cool stories out of there, <laughs> but they also paid me a thousand dollars for my troubles when I left. And I was like, man, that was the sickest month. And I was in from there. I'd already had some film experiences, but um, <coughs> from there, I, yeah, I just, what did I do? I, um, I started on some commercials. I ended up pretty quickly I into uh, working at Panavision which is a, a, a camera and lighting equipment rental house, powerhouse, I should say. Um, and I really spent like, uh, was it a year or two there, um, which was a really good thing for me because I, I just learned all the equipment inside out, back to front, um, you know, testing it, just handling it all the time and meeting all the gaffers and the DPs that came in to do tests and stuff. So it was like a real kind of university for me. And then I jumped out of there and I started working um, on commercials and a bit of TV um, with Miles Jones. I don't remember him. Um, I was with him for a bit and then and, and Moses was always there in the background working on that level of uh, overseas films that were coming over here. And then shortly after that, I, I jumped on board with Mo and I was just rolling with my brother and um, a lot of international um gaffers and films and I ended up spending most of the time as you know in the feature film game yeah for, for the majority of my years in in in, in that industry um, but yeah uh, what happened from there yeah I had lots of good really cool experiences we'll get into the lessons I suppose 
a lot of travel, met a lot of people, but towards the end, um, the films, you know, started getting a bit taxing and I, and I started to pull away from films and tried to chill out at home more. And so I, I kind of transferred into the commercial industry for a few years. So I, I hung out without going away on these big six month jobs, did commercials in Sydney and, you know, I was already plotting my exit by then with you guys. Um, so a couple of years of just commercials and no films and, yeah, then I made my way out. Did you come? Did you start with Paul? Did you guys start together? No. No, no. It was a real funny... Really? Yeah, it was real funny how it kind of occurred. I thought guys would have been like... It would have been like <coughs> a, a... Like a... You would have got the job through Paul or Paul kind of came through you. No, nah, it, was, it was the strangest thing how it worked out. But I had a, I had a bit of a false start. I remember my... Um, so Paul and my connection goes back because my, my cousin was best mates with Moses, my cousin Ben. And Moses also dated Ben's sister, Emma, my other cousin. They dated for a long time. So our families were connected from years prior. Yep. But interestingly, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the time that you, that I was finishing school and that you were already sort of, because you were one year above me, yep. so you were already a year in the film industry kind of, mm-hmm. or a year mm-hmm. kind of down that path, yep. we weren't really, we weren't hanging out at that time. No. We'd sort of been friends like earlier on before high school, we'd been friends like kind of year six, seven kind of thing. Yep. And then, yeah, and then when we were- I moved out west for a while as well. Well, that was when we were friends, when you lived at Parramatta. It was more it? like that. Yeah, yeah it was, Dundas, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you ended up coming to my school. But when you came to my school, we weren't friends, really. Yeah, yeah. Like we didn't right. have the same social group. No. Um, but in any case, I, I, I remember my cousin Emma was like, you should get into the film industry because she worked in it. She was a producer. And she's like, you should, you should do it. Like, I mean, you know, if you, if you want, it's kind of cool. You get to do- uh, work with cool people, have interesting experiences. You make, you know, pretty okay money. And I was like, yeah, it sounds great. I was working in a fish shop and I'd been doing that for one year out. Like I had two years during school and then one year out of school. Legendary period of your life. Oh, it was, it was, it was epic. <laughs> I really, I liked my time at the fish shop, but I was like, I'd come to the end of my tenure at the fish shop. I, so I remember good. having a, a, a dispute with my boss where I was working seven What was his days. name again? Anthony. Anthony. Anthony, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had an oh, Italian awesome. boss and a Greek boss, yeah. Mario. But um, <laughs> I, um, so I wanted, I remember I was basically running the, running the shop seven days a week, doing a fucking good job of it. And I was like, look, I, bet. I just want $1,000. And he was like, nah, give you 800. And it was like, <laughs> I was like, fuck, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> um, but so anyway, we, we got to this point and, and then my cousin suggested, I was like, yeah, let's give it a go. So she hooked me up. She said, look, I know a really cool gaffer. His name's Miles Jones. So she said, why don't I put you in touch with Miles and maybe you can do some work experience with him. So I spoke with him and he was doing this show and uh, he's like, mate, why don't you come out and spend a few days with us and come and see how I it was works. there, yeah. You were on the I job. I remember that. So I must have called you and been like, bro, I'm coming out on this job that you're on. You're like, yeah. oh, what? Cool. Yeah. And so I remember I'd come and pick you up because I was driving past your place. You're like, That's pick right. me up and we'll go out there together. And it was out like- Dural. It was out there, yeah. It was, Dur- it was like Karingai. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had a set. Up towards Baha'i Temple. Yes, yeah, yeah that's kind of right. Thing. We had some sets there and out at, it was, it was a bushy set. So it was like an outback yeah. uh, story. So it was like Karingai and it was Dural. A lot of driving. <laughs> I did like two seasons of that thing. I know the area as well. Beautiful. A lot of driving, man. But so I, uh, we went out there and I did a few days and I liked it. And I was just, like we all kind of felt in that, when you first get out, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You're just trying to- Keep understand. up. Yeah, you're like, what, what, <laughs> how can I be helpful? Just trying to be helpful. And uh, yeah, no pay, but like, I was super impressed. You, there was, you know, the tea and coffee table where they had like Monte Carlo biscuits going all day. <laughs> yeah, anytime you want, you go and eat Monte Carlo biscuits, you know? And I was refilled. always like, why is no one eating the Monte Carlos or the Kingstons? <laughs> They're the best ones. And I was like, well, I'm going to fucking smash these while I'm here. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, you, you're having this experience. Anyway, Miles was supposed to be my kind of in. start. Yeah, yeah, my in. And uh, he's like, yeah, mate, we'll get you on. We'll get you on another job and we'll start getting you hanging out at the, at the lockup and get you t- teach you the ropes. And I'm like, awesome, man, great. And then he's like, I'll give you a call next week. And then like next week went, didn't hear from him. And then the next week and I called him and yeah, mate, yeah, mate, I'll give you a call, mate. We'll get you down, mate, we'll get you started. I'm like, all right, Miles, thanks, man. Anyway, <laughs> turns out that, that I think the industry went through a bit of a dry patch, but he had nothing for me. And yeah. so 
I remember um, going through a process of writing a resume, which was like one page with really nothing on it besides like, I'm keen and I'll do whatever you want for free. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with the help of my oh, cousin Emma. Industry. And I faxed it out to like all the gaffers in New South Wales. And I faxed it out to uh, like a bunch and a few of them bit back and called me and, you know, a few were nice enough to call me and go, mate, sorry, I got nothing going on at the moment. I got just enough for my guys, but, you know, thanks for, for touching base, whatever. But one of the guys that got back to me was Rick McMullen, um, who T was working with. And I, T and I didn't know each other at this stage. And so Rick was like, yeah, I got a job, um, Centennial Park. Uh, why don't you come and meet us? Oh, yeah. And it was like 5 a.m. Centennial Park. We had to meet... <laughs> You know, when you shoot in Centennial Park, you have to meet at the at gate. The gate. All the trucks and vehicles have to line up and then you get escorted to the location. Mm. So, I, you know, I've rocked up and I'm like, you know, I can't see anyone and there's these big trucks and, you know, then there's Rick and Rick's like full of beans. Hello, mate. How are you, mate? Good he's to see you, He's been there since three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then he's introduced me to T and Al and Suttos. Pete, yeah. Yeah, Steve wasn't on that job and I was like, you know, and you guys were like a few years older than me and all <clears> like <throat> big jack dudes and I'm like, oh, wow. I was all impressed by you guys. And, and then, you know, we got out to the thing. And then I remember we, yeah, it was, it was cool. We shot, it was, I think it was a conditioner commercial. I remember a lot of hair and a lot of 18Ks in the kind of foresty, the pine forest section of that park. And we ran heaps of power lock. Yeah, I, I actually left as soon as you arrived. Did was, you leave? Yeah, it was on, I left and never, I left for like a year and a half. Like travel. Oh, like like after like a I didn't short do that after. day. Like it was like that day I was flying out and I was just there. You with did you. some of that day because I remember yeah, we ran like to a, the truck the to morning. get gear. Yeah, it was like the morning or something. Holy shit! And then then you took out. off. Yeah. How funny. Yeah. So I was destined to be T's replacement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. So so I so I had that entry and then it would kind of end up circling back around where I would end up by chance working with Moses, mm. which was totally by chance because I was working with Sean Conway at the time. And mm. then he's like, we're doing this film. I've got Moses on. And I was like, what? Moses is like my childhood older brother. Mm. And then then you came back on with Moses and then we reconnected at that time. Yeah. And by that stage, we were all buddies. and Yes. But yeah, it was yeah. kind of very interesting how it all played out. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you were working on stealth and then I, I was on the other unit. Yeah, you're at Parachilna. Yeah, and then after that, we kind of converged on the same unit on the next film, and then we did a bunch of films together. Yeah, on main unit. So it was. I mean, you know, the the thread that I that I see with that is like the the thing, and not even going to the lessons yet necessarily, but you don't know what you're doing, but all you knew was that you had to be helpful and you had to work as hard as you could, which was kind of I I can imagine we all just felt that in those early stages. You're just trying to be. As, as helpful as possible. Mm. Well, it's the, the well, the, at least the technician side of things. Um, yeah, it's a real team. And if you don't have those qualities and they're not something, um, usually you, you kind of you kind of get it or you don't. If you don't have those, you, you, you don't last very long. People, they just won't ring you back because you just have, to have that type of, that energy, that can do, you know, that ability to just like, do something straight away and do it with uh, like uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you just won't last if you don't have don't that ask spark. questions. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it. Um, yeah. Crazy. So many years there. Hell, there's so many stories as I'm kind of, as you're talking, as I'm talking and him, there's, there's, there's too many. Too many. You could, it could have its own podcast. What was your best job ever? <sighs> <laughs> the best one. No, well, I mentioned that other one up at uh, Far North Queensland. That was was that, that was Danny Deck Chair? No, that was um, it was called Paradise Found, and it was uh, the life story of Paul Gogan. And Paul Gogan was played by uh, what's the guy's name from Twenty Four? Remember the show Twenty Four? Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, man. Holy shit! It was Kiefer Sutherland, and it was a small crew. It was like. Eight million dollar film type thing, which is that small, realm, which is small. I love those type of films. I only did a handful. They're the sickest ones to work on because you got some good story and a small crew, and it's and it's usually yeah more intimate. Yeah, isn't it's it? more intimate, and I really love those. Yeah, it was Kiefer, and <laughs> man, he could fucking drink. He oh, really? was drinking it by every yeah yeah. It was some, wow, he was cool. He was a, good, a funny dude. Um, Still living his Lost Boys days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, best jobs. Well, you've got one. I know your one. I got. A, I got a few. I know your I got one. Some good ones. My best best job. Best, best job was that would be my the tourist, tourism 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 yeah. Australia. Yeah. yeah, I got that after I'd been away for four and a half years in London. I'm not sure how I got. I think Rick kind of set it up for me. Um, uh, there were a few boys around me, especially my closest mates, that were not very happy that I got that job. But they were happy, <laughs> but they weren't deep down. Yeah, because for sure. it was like... It's the uh, dream job. Yeah, it was three three months, I think, of travel around Australia. from the, And we stayed in the, the most uh, expensive um, eco lodges Australia has to offer in the most remote, remote areas. So... Because they're so remote and everything was shot during kind of daytime, um, well, I didn't have to actually take a lot of kit with me. Uh, we had a private jet, so we'd jump on this private jet, the small crew, and we'd fly into like some remote location where they'd they'd built like some amazing like eco lodge or resort that's like we're talking like five five well nothing under two thousand dollars a room kind of thing. Wow, it was two thousand dollars a room. That's and my up. kind of place. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> But it wasn't like that for the whole crew. Um, we had morning shots on all of these uh, locations and what had happened is um, you would need a skeleton crew to stay in the resort or the um, eco lodge and then the rest of the crew would either stay down the road at the <laughs> roadhouse or at the camping ground or some shit, something pretty meagre. And every time we got to the location, um, the director would sit there and go, all right, we need focus puller, which is the guy that sits next to the camera and um, makes the camera focus. And then he goes, oh, we need, we need the actors. Um, and T, I'll just keep you here just in case. We need <laughs> some light. <laughs> I feel like. Yes. Who was the <laughs> DP, the director of photography? That was um, Sean Meehan. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Were you good friends dude. with him? Yeah, we were close. Mad. Yeah. Perfect. And, um, and Big tall guy. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I could see over the three months, people were just getting more and more irritated at the fact that I was you were there because the I was fucking absolutely, I did nothing. <laughs> I mean, I tried, I'd bring in like a bit of <laughs> polyester a reflective thing and stand there next to the actor and wa- wave it around and then Sean would go, just call the sun, ah, get rid of it. <laughs> going into a clown, <laughs> clouds. Yeah. But we went everywhere. We went to Lizard Island. I don't know mm. if you guys heard of Lizard Island. No, no. And it's like a private island. Like it's an I- it's an island in the middle of um, the the Great Barrier Reef, and it's like not like way north of Cairns, and you have to get a private jet to get there. And Jesus. this place is like it's like one of those those scenes out of you know the fucking James Bond movies kind of style. Mm. But what they have is like these private beaches, and what will happen is you go stay in this resort, and then they they put you in a little boat and they take you out to your own private beach in this, you know, like we're talking tropical paradise with turtles and whale sharks. And elk, no, sorry, not whale sharks, the bronze, bronze whale sharks. Oh, uh, yes, bronze, yeah. Whatever they are. Whalers. Yeah, bronze <laughs> whalers. All of this is like fucking like, it's just teeming with life. And then they drop you off and you've got your deck chairs and bottle of Dom and cheeses and everything and that's your beach. And then they come back whenever you want them to to keep feeding you or dropping lunch off or whatever or just leave you alone for the whole day and i ended up going out and the same thing happened they're like oh we're going out on the reef gonna shoot okay it's cut you know it's a it's a skeleton crew um (laughs) and this is all underwater mind you you guys just in case t just bring some reflector i'm like sean you guys are going to be like under the water (laughs) scuba gear i don't have a scuba license and he's like Oh, just in case, mate, just come. <laughs> I, like, yes. I can totally see that. Dude, it was so good. They keep I, you that it's like the, the industry is so built on relationships. Oh, that right. You would have been spinning some good chit chat yeah. around camera. It was you like know, having that kid around. Hilarious. Yeah, you like you want to around for the. You make yourself useful, you know. Yeah, you're kind of like you, you're there, but th- th- that day I I didn't. I just kind of everyone was jumping in the water. I was like, Sean. If you need anything, just yell out. I'm just going to put a pair of goggles on and go for a, for a little swim. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking like two hours later, I remember looking up because the, the reef up there has so much life in it that it, 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 you just immerse yourself. You start getting lost. Like you'll look at one block of coral and there'll be just, like yeah. 200 different life forms with all these different colors popping out of it. And you just sit there staring at it for like 20 minutes and then you just float on to the next bit, the next bit, the next bit. 
Then all of a sudden I floated over this ledge and it was just like this drop. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, that's deep. And then I kind of looked behind me and I saw a couple of little um, black, uh, the black tip sharks. Yeah. And I was like, holy fuck, like Where there could be I? a big shark out here. <laughs> and then I kind of parked my head up and I looked for the boat and the boat was like a little dot on the fucking horizon. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like a long way away from the <laughs> boat right now. And I was like, shit, I hope no one's been like calling me or something like that. So I kind of swam back, but yeah, that uh, was one fantastic job. I was <laughs> We're so going to dig up this commercial. It was amazing. <laughs> the it commercials? Was, uh, yeah, yeah. We, had, we went on one of the most remote four-wheel drive tracks in Australia, supposedly, in Western Australia, and we went out to a, um, a community that was um, out on this point, uh, this, like, point. Um, I've forgotten what it's called, but it was, uh, it was spectacular, man. Mad. I saw parts of Australia mm. I thought I'd never see. And after the trip, I came back and I thought, you know what? I don't think I like that style of travel. I think even if I had a lot of money. You could never do it. No. Nah. Uh, it's just too decadent. It opens a lot of mm. doors as well, the industry. because you get strangely getting, disconnected from uh, the place yeah. you're in, isn't it? When yeah. you've got like a bottle of champagne and deck chairs yeah. on a remote beach, you're like, yeah, this doesn't uncomfortable. fit. Uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I was looking at the camp. There was a campsite next to where this big, like uh, fucking beautiful um, – uh, it was in Tassie. It was a big, beautiful um, uh, eco lodge, and it's famous around the world for its architecture. I've forgotten the name of it, but uh, I was looking across at the campsite, and everyone was just having fun. And the people that were in this this thing were just just looked a bit bored, all stiff, and not yeah, talking to each other. Not talking, paper, you know, mm-hmm. have their little meal, and very quiet. And I thought, oh man, this is like it's not a holiday for me, you know. Mm. But it was awesome. We on chopper chopper flights and. The whole bit was great. Over like the Kimberleys, that was mad. I got a best gig that was kind of similar-ish. It was a tropical thing, but but not um, not with the decadence. But it was um, it was a small budget film that uh, an Australian film, and the a guy that we all that we used that I used to work with a lot that we've all worked with, Jason Pool, Pooley, Pooley, Pooley. Uh, who was who? It was a real legend. He he was actually very still quite responsible for getting me into the the the, <coughs> the mix with Sean Conway and stuff. Who would end up being sort of my entry into films and whatnot. But um, Pulley said, "Mate, I've got a job, mate. Got a job coming up. It's uh, mate, I'd love to have you on it. It's either going to be the best job you've ever done, or it's going to be the worst. I can't really tell you." <laughs> and I was like, no, it "Sounds interesting. Tell me more." And he said, "Look." Um, it's a reduced crew. We're shooting in the Great Barrier Reef. We're out there for, for six weeks. And uh, there's like 22, 22 of us on the crew. And, uh, you know, we're going to travel out there and then we're going to live on this island for six weeks. There's no telecommunications. There's no internet. There's no power. Um, it's just us camping out there shooting this film. And I was like, wow, fuck, sounds pretty cool. And it was like small amount of money. And, you know, like just um, I, was working, I was working for the lighting and the grip department. I was a mm, swinger. Mm, mm. And uh, that's what they're called. Swingers. Swingers when you, yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it, man. It sounds <clears> mad. <throat> and so we were on this little <laughs> island and we, you know, we traveled up to, uh, we got to Gladstone and then we took a boat ride out and the boat rides like six hours off the coast or whatever. And then you end up at Masthead Island, which is this little uninhabited island in the Great Barrier Reef. And um, that was our spot. We each had a tent that had been set up for us and there was like a little food area and there was a cook, Andrew Smith, who was a total legend. Um, and yeah, we'd shoot like, we kind of shot whatever needed to be done that day. And then it's like back at the camp, like hanging out. It's like a real simple life for six weeks, real simple food, real simple kind of everything, you know, like, no, you know, you're just making like instant coffee and it was, it was really nice. And so there was a whole bunch of drama and shit that unfolded on that film, but, um, which, which kind of made it even cooler, but, um, it was just, I don't know, living away in what isolation. Was the drama? The drama was the God. It was such a fucking quagmire, man. The um, <laughs> there was a the, the film was about a guy and a girl, a young couple who are in love, who go away to this island together, and then shit goes wrong, and it t- it's a horror film, so it turns turns real turns real nasty. And um, I got to really shoot the loo. Yeah, go for it, man. But so <clears throat> we 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 learned it really early on that the the male like the male lead couldn't act and not only could he not act he was completely unable to show any affection for the female lead 
And she's meant to be oh. like his, his, you know, the love of his life. So this whole film is about these two people. There's like three people in the film. Poor those two cast. and then a ghost. And so he was a shit actor. Like he had no acting skills. He was unable to connect with her. And so um, it just made for a whole lot of tension because they'd be shooting these scenes like, oh, okay, we're on the boat. Um, and I remember the first time I was exposed to it, it was like day two or whatever, day one. And we're on this, we're on a boat just off the island and they're, they're meant to be, we're shooting them arriving at the island. And the director's like, um, yep, okay, now just put your arm around her. Yep, great. And you're looking at the island together. Just uh, bring her a bit closer. G- give her a kiss. You know, that's your, that's your, that's your girlfriend. It's your wife. Like, mm-hmm. you love her. You just got married. Like, this is the greatest time of your life, you know? And it was like this mechanical, like, I don't know if he could kiss her. Like, it was really, really weird. Anyway, he was the director's son. Oh. And there was all this shit that came to light. Oh, about you know mistake. yeah the father pushing him into this role to try and make him something he wasn't and like it was fucked up but so and we're on this <laughs> we're on this island right and then oh. and then at a point there was a rumor that developed amongst with really with the director where he thought that I was involved with the with, that with the girl <laughs> yeah and were you <laughs> you probably were I'm gonna reveal it to you guys Found on this show <laughs> I'm gonna tell you guys first time I've ever told anyone oh I kind of just caught that. I was not. Oh. <laughs> like one of the few times in my life I wasn't. <laughs> Let's be real. But um, yeah, I wasn't, right? Like we, we became friends, but that's the thing. There was like 22 or 24 of us on this island. We all became friends. Yeah. We're living in each other's pocket for six weeks. You know, it got fucking tribal, right? So yeah, those shoots generally do. There's usually a bit of, bit of bonking around. Yeah. That kind of shoot. Yeah. So I can understand All why the director the was thinking that. Yeah, yeah, it's not <laughs> uncommon, right? Oh, yeah, it's pretty common. Young best boy, yep. strapping young man. You were training on that trip, Actress. I remember. Yeah, yeah. I took my rings. Took oh, I had ring. a pair of training straps. A kettlebell? Uh, nah, just the training straps. But you had like shot bag. I remember I think Pooley was doing a bit of training. With, was he? You, uh, uh, you yeah, we're doing some shit. Yeah. So but, in, in a, you know, so you can kind of imagine, but it just, it just it, it, the whole thing went pear-shaped. Somehow or another, they managed to produce the film and put it out there. And again, I think it's being handed out for free at Big W, if you find yourself there. <laughs> it was a total B-rate flea. It. But it was a fucking cool six weeks. We were, you know, so I was spearfishing and, um, yeah, we just, it's living a simple life and it was really nice. I loved it. Oh, so good. Mad. Yeah. What was your highlight? Oh, best gig. Best gig. Uh, I was thinking just now. Well, it's funny because because I spent more time on feature films. And I think your best feature film. Well, well, this is the thing because you said best gig, and they're a different kind. Like when I think world, what was my best gig? Anything that's six months long can't be a best gig. It's just they're just big projects. Yeah, there's there's parts of it which are amazing and locations. This is the other side of the and spectrum, isn't it? How many people you got on a, on a, like when we're talking big budget, we're talking like Hollywood, now. Hollywood block, block, yeah. blockbusters. Yes. Yeah. Shot here yes. in Sydney. So we got the matrix. I know we went through these names before, but, um, great Gatsby, um, Australia, is some of the biggest Australia. Superman. I mean, oh, matrix was the biggest trilogy, like budget wise ever. In the history what of was it, film, it was like three hundred mil or something. It was Cannot unbelievably uh, uh, um, huge because our dollar had like plummeted. Ah, yes. And the right. Yanks thought, right, we're going to shoot there, and we're going to blow out this budget that we'd never be able to afford to shoot anywhere else mm. in the world. It was two years of shooting, wasn't it? Was it was enormous. It was. They they had the fucking hangers at the um, at the airport. They'd taken them over as, as film sets. everywhere. They'd they had met every more. single set yeah. at. Um, Fox, Fox Studios. Yeah. We're talking sets that are like they're, they're fifty meter long, with however many high roofs, mm, mm. just filled with props and lights. And I've never seen anything anything like that kind of scale. But mm. the same thing with the gigs that you're on. And how mm. many people were, would you say were working on some of these shoots? I don't know, three hundred people. It's hard. Like where do you you've got the shooting crew and then you have got the offset crew. Yeah, so you like you know, building props. Yeah, the construction crew is the biggest. It's the biggest crew, and you know the the, the it's team itself fluctuates. Twenty four hours a day. Yeah, around because, the clock. Because well, if, while you guys oh, go home to sleep, yeah, there's the next a team crew coming in. in yeah, that type of down, thing. Yeah, builds it. And yes. then you come in and shoot in it. Yeah, and they schedule these things so that they're they're, they're shot in the shortest amount of total time, as you know, so they have 
yeah, teams rolling around, sets, you know, in a certain order so they can keep this thing going the whole time. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of people who, who have part in, in those films. But you asked me about, like, what my best gig was. There was times on those features where there was, there was definitely awesome, awesome, awesome parts. And when I think about, like, commercials and shorter jobs that are nice and sweet, like, that's probably the nicest... Like I think like, I, when I think of best gig, I do think of some of the commercial experiences. And oh, I guess one that I'll share was um, I took a year and a bit off. I went to uni for a while, and um, I didn't I didn't work uh, through that time except for in my uni holidays. And it was like, yeah, it was was it uni or college? I think it was when I went to college, and I had a couple of weeks off in between the terms. And I just jumped straight onto the, to Australia. They were shooting Australia, um, the Baz Luhrmann Australia. And I, I just told the boys, I was like, I'm on holidays for these two weeks. So can I work every day of those weeks? And I just make like $7,000 in that short amount of time. And then I'd live off that for the rest of the term. And I kept doing <laughs> that. It was, went for the whole year and it was a real painful job for a lot of people. It was a hard job, I should say. Yeah. Really long so I didn't have to endure that. And, and it was with the team that I had been working with all up until that point. Um, and so I was kind of like on the that outside. Conway? That was, yep, too? yep. And Peaches and Peaches, Simon yeah, and yeah. all the guys and Al Laguna. Uh, so anyway, they endured the whole film. But at the very end of the film, they had a bit of, uh, they had some pickups where they, they come back. They, th- they finished the primary shoot they go into the editing room and then they come out and they need extra bits that they want to change or add to the story to make the narrative work and what for whatever reason. So I did a month of pickups and then after that, and this is I had finished that year of study. Um, uh, they they needed to shoot. They had they were in cahoots with the um, Australian Tourism. Um, they had help. Uh, there was some government funding for the film because it was called Australia and it pretty much showcased all of Australia if you've seen mm-hmm. it. Um, you know, whether you think it's a very accurate depiction or not is another story. Um, but uh, they, sh- they had to shoot a commercial. And, and Peaches, our friend Steve Daly, um, we've mentioned him a few times here today, um, he was going to be, he was set to be the gaffer for that and he only needed two other guys. And he said, oh, Paulie, do you want to go for this shoot? Um, it, it was like, was it a week? It was a week, but uh, basically we did a tourism commercial similar to T on all the locations um, that Australia was shot at and a few, you know, other little nice spots. Um, uh, so I kind of got to travel to those places without having to do all of the great, <laughs> the whole year of shooting with everyone like cutting in. It was like the skeleton crew. Um, going to the hot spots. Going to the hot spots and, and enjoying it and just the three of us and, and Justin Plummer, uh, you know, <laughs> Justin Plummer, Golden Tonsils. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's got a very extremely deep um, voice, this, this legend. He drove the Jenny up all the way up. I just got flown in with Peaches. Um, and we went to the Kimberley Rangers, got chopped into the gorge there and slept in swags, oh, yeah. you know, in like these marble caverns with the little river trickling and, and, and swimming in these beautiful fresh water um, little pools. It was with Mandy Walker. Uh, uh, she's a very yeah. accomplished, awesome female director of photography. And One of very few, isn't she? Yeah, there's, there's more these days. And, and anyway, it was just a great week where we were in swags, the, the open stars for some nights, and then we'd be, we'd be camping in little tents, um, you know, on another reserve another time. And uh, it, was just a, it was just a great week. And similar to you, we didn't work hard at all. It was just, um, you know can't go anywhere without like a lighting team because isn't it yeah yeah it's a just in personal. case yeah just in case it was nice there was a few plane rides and, and chopper rides in there and um i haven't been up to that part of australia yet but i plan to go up there and see go the back. territory for oh, my, so beautiful. my next big it's birthday worth a, worth a trip isn't it yeah that was yeah so you know that was that was a really cool week it's funny how you experience that stuff because I, I did a gig uh, a reality show out in um Kununurra, Northern yes. WA. Yep. And it was sort of destined to be like an awesome gig. We're staying on the – there's a like a station. Kununurra yeah, that, that's where we stayed. That's where you that's, stayed, yeah, right? That's, yeah, that's where the film – We're staying there and it was said from the beginning, like, look, we're, we're shooting during the day. 
there's no real lighting that can be done, but mm. we've got to bring one lighting person. So they'll, you know, I think it was our lagoon and stuff like Joey, perfect gig. Like you can go up, fucking chill out for a week and, you know, and I was like sick. And, you know, we had uh, like a couple of lights that we like sort of balloon lights. And it was like, look, there's a couple of little sort of um, evening shoots we're going to do. But again, we can't really light it. So you just set up one balloon light during the day and then that's all, that's all we got. We've got to make it work. Mm. And I was mm. like, great, you know. And then got there and, you know, for the most part I was bludging, but then all of a sudden like the, the, there was, cause it was a reality show. There's like five different cameramen and they all bring their own little lights <laughs> and then they all bring their own little like generators. And then before you know it, it's like fucking 10 PM. You're shooting out in like some croc infested waterway and they're like, mate, can I get a light over here? Can I get a light? Yep. Just here, just here. Can you just get me a light? And you're like, yep. And they're like, just grab my little generator. And you're like, yep, cool. I'll set that up. And then you're like, job done. And then another one's like, can I get one of those two, please? Can you, oh. you know, and before reality you know it, you're like, worst. you're running around and you're like, why was this shit not planned? Right. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's reality TV. It's, Real, that's it's another a, realm. A oh, lower cost horrible. production. Oh. The planning kind of sucks. And it's just, you know, there's less budget, like all oh. those things. And you're like, Oh, this fucking sucks balls now. Yeah. Like, but yeah, it's funny how that stuff plays out. Yes. Kind of true what Pooley said to me where this could be the best job you've ever done or, <laughs> or it could the be the worst. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, you never know going into it. Fuck. What yeah. Re reality is another sphere. What's your worst? What was mm. your worst experience on set? I've raced them all from my memory now, bro. <laughs> mine, was a, <laughs> mine was a night shoot. For a, it was a, it was a live cross for NBC. Some, um, I think it was NBC, an, an American broadcast, and they were crossing to. We had to do two locations. One was the Opera House, and one was Manly Beach. I can't remember what it was for. Was it New Year's Eve? No, nah, it wasn't. It was a, It was. I, I really can't remember what it was for, but it. it you know, seemed, there was mm. no special event on at mm. the time. Finbar Collins was on it. Oh, Finbar. Finbar, he's a great guy. The, the, we did Maybe. the Opera House one. That was okay. But the Manly Beach one was um, uh, what looked like it was going to be pretty straightforward, get a few lights out. They had a camera up one end of the beach looking up along the whole beach and they wanted a few lights, big lamps, like 20Ks or whatever, positioned every sort of 50 metres to just cast a bit of light out over the beach and onto the water. And we had a whole lot of firepower, heaps of lights, heaps of cable, like a lot of electricity and not many guys. And then... it it turned into one of the most torrential fucking downpours I can remember and heavy winds and we we're just exposed. And it was like, you just fucking need deep in water, trying not to get electrocuted. It's quite scary. Trying to, when yeah. That happens, isn't it? You're shitting yourself. You don't really know what the hell. Was it like windy? Like a Dude, it was windy as fuck. So we're putting yeah. umbrellas up yeah, 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 and yeah. hogwire yeah. and it's just blowing off and the gaffer's screaming at you, man, I fucking don't even get up. My lamps get fucked up. Fucking, I'll have your ass. You know, you're like, oh God. It was the chicken hawk. Oh. The horrible guy to work for. Um, people never did die on set. Like it's, it's, not, it's not like an irregular thing. It, 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 it happens. happens. Yeah, that, that, that I don't did know happen what it's like, like now. Seven it's years a, ago, it's such that. a cowboy nature to parts of yeah. it, right? Like and even big hours, even the fact that equipment. us, like without any formal qualification, and all yeah. of a sudden I'm on a beach in Manly overseeing, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of volts of fucking electricity hanging over in a public heads. space, yeah. and you know, it's just mm. like, well, how did I get here? I never had to study <laughs> it, fucking. <laughs> Like I was, I'm not an electrician, <laughs> but I got like some electrical tools in my pouch and shit. Like it's so strange, right? Yeah, it is. That yeah. you end up doing that. So yeah, that, I just remember that. I was like, this is fucked. This oh, is the shittest job. I hate this industry. Like, you know, you're just cursing it all night. Oh, Yours? God. I had a, I remember having, wow, this was not a shit time. This was a, like a bit of a dangerous, dangerous shoot, which was quite hilarious Ooh. at the same time. Um, I went up in a, we were at a, what was it? It was some, like uh, one of those out outdoor animal uh, sanctuaries and we were shooting a, um, this male fucking lion and it was <laughs> massive. <laughs> it was, well, it's the biggest cat I've ever, I'd ever seen at, at, at that time. And um, they had it in its cage and they were like, okay, hey, we're shit in its cage. And then we turned up, <laughs> props turned up with this big prop backdrop and the, the lion handler was like, Oh, no one said anything about about that prop, and uh, they're like, "Well, you know, obviously it's got to look like he's, you know, not in a cage, and we've got to put something behind it." And so they had a bit of a dispute, and they're saying, "Look, what could possibly go wrong?" And he's like, "Mate, you just 
they're very unpredictable animals and bringing in these foreign objects kind of, you know, can freak them out and you know, it just doesn't seem right. Anyway. They're, they're like, like relax, mate. <laughs> yeah, they just put it in, put it in, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And they talked him into it and they got this prop in and then they put me up in a, in a cherry picker or what do, what do you call it? Like a... Um, cherry picker. Boom yeah, lift. Yeah, boom yep. lift. Yep. And they're those things that have got a little bucket in it and, and a big um, arm yep. that takes you up right up into the... I don't know, fuck it, it was a really high one. <clears throat> and we're on an open plane and there's a big storm coming and I was like, fuck, I don't want to go up in that. You, were, you know, when there's, when there's bad weather coming and you're like, this just needle sticking out, <laughs> out of the ground <laughs> yeah. and mm-hmm. you're thinking, I don't want to be in here. The cables you running get, straight back down to the earth. Yeah, you don't want to be hit by fucking lightning and I'm like mm-hmm. sitting in this bucket watching this storm kind of float out on the, on the horizon and then um, all the boys are downstairs and I had like this bird's eye view of, everything that was happening underneath me. And I could see um, they brought this line into the pen with this fucking big fake wall behind it made of foam. And um, they're like, okay, get the line's attention, get the line's attention. And the handler's trying to get it to face camera and banging the fucking cage. And they had this little glass thing where the camera's looking at the lion and the lion just kind of walks in and he just struts. And they just look straight up at the foam wall and you see him kind of look to the top of it and then he just like squats and wobbles his butt. And then the, the, the handle is like, no, no, no. <laughs> and his thing just fucking jumps. I couldn't believe it. It fucking launched and it lodged its fucking hands into the foam wall and went, and then it lodged the other one in, and then it just started climbing <laughs> the fucking this foam wall and it gets over the top. And I just see the fucking film crew just sprint. <laughs> In every direction, <laughs> into the trucks, into the doors, and everyone shut the doors and fuck it. It was unbelievable. And I thought, I'm so glad I'm in this fucking picture right now. <laughs> oh, God, that is so good. Oh, it was man. awesome. The thing's strutting around, but they ended up crawling it and getting back in the cage. And <laughs> But, yeah, it was fucking great. Probably got euthanized later that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't be trusted anymore. Yeah, it was amazing, man. The muscle on this thing. Fucking hell. Oh, it's- fuck. So scary. So scary. Remember when we had in, uh, in New Zealand on Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe, mm-hmm. they had the wolves? The wolves? They had wolves brought in. Yeah, for the snow set. Remind me. Oh, well, they had a cage. I mean, there was just a-, a Massive, like a, aren't they? They're fucking huge. Yeah, they brought in proper wolves because- mm-hmm. it, And we didn't, we didn't get, you know, you saw them in the cage, mm-hmm. but it was in that snow set in that fucking old chicken breeding f- warehouse that we were in. We are in some funny spots, that shoot. Yeah, some real funny spots. But it was cool. It's like, oh, damn, they're real wolves. They're yeah, fucking yeah, yeah, big, yeah. man. Scary. Saw a lot the of animal cool thing, yeah. The, yeah. It's a bit I weird. saw some fucking strange shit with animals mm, on. Mm. So. Dude, I remember being in a cherry picker once. Fucked up. In Raymond Terrace. And it was the um, same thing. Like when, you, when you're doing that, you're usually, you're, you've got the biggest light and you're kind of being like, you're the light, you're, you're elevated really high up in the sky. And so you're essentially the most important light source because you're, you're acting as like the moonlight in that scene or whatever. So like you have to be there all night. Like you can't, they can't shoot it without you. So you're stuck in this fucking thing. And, you're like, and when I say you're stuck in this thing, like if you've got to go to the toilet, you're doing it in a bottle, you're storing it up there. Like there's, you cannot come down. There's no interruption to what you're doing. Uh, and we didn't have smartphones back then. I don't even remember what the fuck oh, I was doing. Gosh, You're like playing just snake and shit. <laughs> just sitting there like thinking. It's really weird, right? Not to be oh, replied. But I remember being uh, up in the cherry picker, shit's going on and uh, they're shooting this whole fucking thing and this this wind is ripping through and oh, you know, yeah. covered in bugs and whatever. And there, I've got the safety guy telling me, mate, um, he's jumped onto our channel. He's like, mate, up there, how's the wind? And I'm like, yeah, it's all right. You know, it's, it's getting pretty heavy. And he's like, I'm going to send you up a little like wind meter or whatever. Mm. Mate, if it gets past 24, whatever on the wind meter, we got to bring you down. All right. It's, it's just the law. Um, just gets dangerous. And I'm like, yeah, no worries at all. And then the gaffer's like, how you doing, Joe? You all right up there, man? Like, yeah, good. <laughs> He's like, Here we mate, go. you just, you just let us know. You just let us know if it gets a bit windy up there for you, man. I'm like, yeah, I'll let you know. And then every kind of few minutes, the gaffer's checking in like, where you at, Joe? And I'm like, oh, we're, we're good. We're at 22. He's like, okay, mate, you let me know. You let me know. If it gets 24, bring you down. 
And I'm like, great. And the wind's picking up. And I'm like, fuck, this is getting heavy. This thing's like shaking around. And then oh, I'm like sucks. 23, 24. And he's like, hey, you going, Joe? I'm like, oh, um, boss, man, it's, it's, it's 24. Okay, mate, just give us a couple minutes, mate. Just give us a couple minutes. <laughs> Stay there, mate. And I'm like, hey, it's, uh, it's 26, man. And he's like, hey, we're almost done down here, mate. Just hold it together. Yep, we, we hear you, mate. We hear you. And you're like, this is so fucked. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> But that's kind of indicative. Collateral. Like there's that is there's a good story that time pressure y- yes. to everything. It's like it's gotta happen now. Every other department is ready to pull the trigger. We've made it, we everything can't align drop the here. ball. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We don't want to be the ones. And the, you don't want to be the one. That's right, because if it's the light <laughs> if it's the young lighting guy, it's like, I gotta come down, guys, this is too dangerous. And then it's like we had to stop the shoot because that young lighting guy couldn't hack the pressure. Yeah. It just it's yeah. it's so there's so there's the this this whole hierarchy thing. Totally. Minutes. Wasn't there a time on what line, which wardrobe where they were spending per minute? It was some ridiculous amount of money because they had the chopper, like Chinooks and shit. Yeah, that's bring. right. What yep. was, were you there? Was that the, you were there. When we were chop it up. Yeah. Day. yeah. yeah. What was that oh, day? it was a set. Um, if I remember, it was in Arthur's Pass on the South Island. Mm-hmm. New Zealand. Just outside New Zealand. of Christchurch. Yeah. And we were staying in Christchurch. These, the shoot days were like this and it went for a long time where we would get picked up because of the we had to drive hour 45 or was it 45? Hour 45. Hour 45 there. there. And so we had drivers pick us up. We'd get in the back. Mini bus. Mini bus and just be like sleep on the way in. We'd get there and we had, um, we were shooting on the top of a mountain and they had a number of helicopters with a helipad. They build all this infrastructure for it's the two, shoot. Two choppers. And they, you know, they build car parks, they build catering tents, marquee tents, and they've shipped in all of these porter comms, you know, little temporary kind of offices and, and dwellings and containers. And we're there at this, at, 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 I guess you call it base. Um, you know, you go there and then, you know, you, you open the trucks and you're servicing the chute, which is on a mountain, and they're literally choppering us up. And they've got this, it was so awesome. I think it was the first time I've been on a chopper. Same. And um, they had a route, and this is if you if you Google Arthur's Pass, so beautiful. Um, they got these mountain ranges, and it's kind of cut through by these these beautiful rivers. And they had like a like a route where they would go around. Uh, it's a one direction route, so they would they would they would take off in one direction, and they might come in through the valley, then come up, and then come up to the top of the mountain, drop people off, and then come back around. Um, and then you know at the end of the day, um, so they're faring up they've, like. 150 people up to the mountain so it maybe takes an hour mm. of them just doing circuits and you're in line yep. getting the chopper go up they come down and get the next people plus and the kid as well i guess it was already there it, right. it was choppered up so we had containers down at the base yeah. and then we had containers up on the, the mountain so the the rigging elects the guys who come in and prep the set for the shooting crew which was us uh, the cool guys Let's face it, um, we, they've already Champagne kitted unit. out. They've made a kit for us. You know, they've decided what gear we want up there and they, they, they bloody chopper it all up. Uh, at the same time, we had another set next to that base, um, which was like a huge open paddock field. It was like beautiful grasslands. And that was the site of a huge battle that happens in the line, which in the wardrobe. Um, so they had that, plus they had this marquee, huge one that was like wet weather cover um and so there was like a studio but in a marquee and dude that was a big fat waste of money oh that, that was, was like the hot most high-tech windproof yes cannot be cry like it this thing can Mate, withstand anything so when the weather came and in there because it, it's like pretty and much it, snowing on us flattened. at the top of the mountain <laughs> 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 it's just like, we're there and the, you know the choppers get landed because the weather's just mayhem and yeah. then you go inside the studio and the sides of this thing is just going whoosh, whoosh. Oh, and then we got yuck. the rig and all the lights in the rig the space lights are just like freaking you know oh, just yuck. flapping around in there anyway it's funny it was cool because we got like some really big lights um kind of choppered around like on the paddock we had those big lightning strikes and peniaku oh, tongan legend oh, brother Penny. was like hey buddy put some slings on it yeah. yeah, get that chopper to come here, pick up this light, take it to the other side. It was just, <laughs> it was just funny. But, it, you know, all of that infrastructure just cost a shit ton of money and the amount of actual seconds getting filmed was very, very little. So when it was like budget to screen time ratio, I think it was just extremely expensive. Yeah, We're like getting very little millions done. Millions and millions a minute. Oh, yeah, it was just, just disgusting. Oh, yeah. 
Tell me, um, talk to me about what you guys learned over this. Give me your, give me your three lessons. <clears throat> uh, I've written some down. <laughs> I, I look. There's so many, and when I go back to what, what T was saying about how he learned a lot from from Rick, and I, I feel like I was kind of a similar, uh, and maybe we all were. Like we were young, and you know, like any any of your first jobs that you have with like other people and men and adults and stuff like that. I personally learned a lot from that industry just as a person. And, um, you know, that might've happened in any other industry that I applied myself into that this was the one. So I, I, I learned, you know, heaps of shit, just like how to get up early, yeah. how to turn up to work, you know, that type of stuff, which I didn't really have, you know, those huge role models or, you know, you know, in my life, I guess at that time, except for, you know, I was working with Mo and all the guys there, they were at that level. It was like jumping into a, a running race and you're like, fuck, I've got to catch up. So I learned a lot of things just, you know, personally that I, I'll forever, you know, I'm thankful for. Little lessons little from different people, you know. Uh, you had Rick as your – and that, that team. Definitely my – yeah, my, my kind of mentor okay, at the time. Yeah. So I, I had several because of the nature of the, the work that I did. You know, Moses, this is G-Man, this is Penny Aku I mentioned – there's, there's so many actually, and you know, you All learn mentors, aren't they? Yeah, and you learn good things from them. You also learn what not to do from a lot of them. And, yep. and you know, there was a lot of shit that went down. And you're like, fuck, when it's my chance, I'm not going to do it like that. You know, <laughs> that kind of happens on, on a, on a well, week to week basis. And it and can be con- very consuming, the industry. Oh, it totally. Can, it does a lot of, can do a lot of damage to your personal life and, <clears> and, um, and your health. Yep. Time. You know? We saw that, right? Yeah, that's half the reason why we. I'm going to uh, give you a couple of mine and see if you jump in off the back yeah, of this. Yeah, 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 okay. Because um, obviously there's a lot of acknowledgements, but I want more things that I've taken away universally. One, mm. it's, it's not as glamorous as you think, mm. right? And the film industry is the perfect example of that. It looks fuck, like we've told these awesome stories and you're like, wow, they got choppered and they got picked up and they got to stay in fucking tourist resorts and all that shit. But at the end of the day, we, we got to a point where we're like, Man, this is fucked. Like our health is taking a battering. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not training regularly. Your, your, your income is all over the place. It's like just this total imbalance of like work life kind of shit. And there's so many people dealing with shit, you know, that we experience like through the jobs and whatnot because of the nature of the work. So it just makes me think like sometimes what you see from the outside is that something is not quite as glamorous as it comes across. Mm-hmm. Um, one, the, the the second one for me that was that is a huge one in our business, um, and I tried to kind of sum it up into a nice little phrase, but that is action over perfection. And what I was thinking there is that because of the time pressure that you get on a film on a on a on a shoot where things have to happen like you know yesterday, yesterday um, sometimes taking action is more important than coming up with the perfect strategy. So oftentimes they'll be like, hey, here's a problem that we have to address. And instead of like taking heaps of time to deliberate about the best way to approach it, it's like, j- here's a plan. Sounds good enough. Let's go. Fucking get it up there. And everyone just does it. And it's like, I think that's been really helpful for us because we're really good at just like, oh, you got an idea? Sounds good enough. Let's go. You know, and we mm. get the shit done, especially with our gym build and stuff like it's that. That's so true. And I, I guess one of the points I got here is, does jump off the back and and it's for the gym as well as for any, any other aspect of my life, but um, it's the nothing's impossible attitude that I got from the film industry. Yeah. So when, you know, when, when you're working in retail or any other industry, you know, it, you, you see your shop, you know, and you see your, your, your place of work and you travel to there and it, it, it's kind of a very small little world. Um, but when you start to work in a commercial, you work in a big film, you see how someone's idea can transform into something like quite incredible. Very and quickly. Very as well. quickly. Um, so it really and efficiently. Yeah. And, and I hadn't seen that sort of thing growing up in, you know, I didn't travel anywhere. Um, and, you know, it, it, I was able to see how just things happen and, and how things can happen if you want it to happen. Um, so, you know, and that goes for like what you just said, which was like, um, guys, we've got to do this. It's like fucking, okay, let's just work out how to do it. Um, and we just get it done with everyone as a team with yeah. the gear that we've got. Um, but also like when planning for something and being involved in the early stages of a film and then, um, you know, f- having a set, uh, a set and they want to light it a certain way. And from the beginning, it's like, 
it has to look like this has to be this time period the light has to be on this angle and then you plan from there and it's like it just taught me uh, how to approach something um and just you know okay we need this and you ask for this we need machines we need this many guys it needs to be done you know a week before and just that kind of like you know uh, something needs to be done nothing's impossible and think as big as you as you want and and it can happen type thing you know yeah and you can expand on that idea but it, i think for our business for sure it was probably easy for us to imagine what we've got now um back then yeah than it would be for anyone else who kind of haven't seen the things that we've seen if you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and i think you know? even like when you're dealing with other industries even now even with our personal build and you say, and you talk to somebody and you're like, hey, we want to do this. And they'll be like, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah like, that's right. Actually, no, you can. You can. You can. You, you can. just got to find right. a way. Yeah. And well, you can't do that on that much money. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you find yeah, a way. I've seen more find a way. on less. That's right. <laughs> exactly. It, it's a real innovation for on a budget thing, isn't it? Yeah. And I think um, that the industry pushes that to its limit. Yeah, yes. even oh. the, it doesn't matter how big the budget is, the budget gets pushed to the limit every time. Oh God, because it, it's it's all about the 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 end result, you know. So that small amount of time that you're just pumping as much mm. energy into this this final product, and it doesn't matter if it's like if it's going over budget and everyone's you know for getting into overtime like big overtime and and it's just strung out, mm. and you're sucking every last bit of blood out of that that process and to, to have the final product as, as good as you could possibly have it. Because once it's done, it's done and that's set in stone, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I think, think a lot of that's carried over yeah, into yeah, what yeah. we do. It's helped us to be able to just, yeah, dream about something and just make it happen. Yeah. Lesson? Um, I think I learned to, a lot about logistics, just the way uh, things play out and um, – strategy uh, when it comes to like uh, taking on new projects and when we sit down and talk about plotting out of timelines and milestones and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I mean, really what we're telling is or, or what we're playing out in our own business model is a story and, and there's a plot and there's a theme and there's uh, a sequence of events and there's character arcs and there's these, these, all of these things that happen in, in every story and if you want a story to play out, and you can, you can, you can write that script, um, then it's more. There's more chance of that, you know, coming to fruition. You know, yeah, it makes because sense. you got those, you got yep. those targets. Um, diplomacy is a big one, just because. Uh, I think a lot of things, but, but what, what people don't realize is when you work on a film set, it's not like working in a mechanics store where everybody is mechanically minded or in a art curating um, gallery where everyone is an artist. It's like you have artists, you have like mechanical minded, you have strong dudes, you, you have strong guys, you've got cooks, you've got actors, you've got money people and they're all in this fucking melting pot. <laughs> That's true. And they're all getting pushed to the limit and they're in each other's face different day in genders. and day out, different locations constantly changing and, and mixing and, if you don't have the ability to get along with other humans, especially humans that you don't necessarily gel with or can uh, relate to, then you don't survive in that, mm. indus in that industry. You just break and you bail because it's all too much, you know? Totally. For listeners... So, you, and you just the tolerance, you know, to be able to tolerate <laughs> stuff that, and, and, and accept people for being different to you, you know? I think it's a big one. I got the same thing. It was the same thing you said, adaptability to, to different teams, to different people and their attitudes with different agendas and their different systems that they have. Because we can rock up one and, and be working very, very closely with a bunch of people that we've never met before. Yeah. And you have to do that from 6 a.m. Like, boom, okay, this is the art director and this is so-and-so. You're like, oh, shit, yep, okay, and, you know. So you have to be really adaptable and think quickly, and then and yeah, build the, a build a very a quick quite, rapport, yeah, a, really a, quick, a, a good relationship in a very small period of time. That's so true. Um, yeah. yeah, and the and the tolerance that exact word, um, yeah, you know, tolerance of in in many different kind of ways. Um, you know, the the like the the the, the environment that you're in. Um, you know, I it's a lot of variables. Yeah, a lot it's of never variables. The same. Never, nah. ever the same. 
That's yeah. why you get so excited when you turn up on a job and it's like, oh, it's my favorite people to work with. That's my yes. favorite camera guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. it's my favorite cook. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but then sometimes you're like, oh, I don't like the look of that person. But <laughs> yeah, oh, fuck, gotta swallow it. Yeah. Well, I had written here fuckwits. <laughs> yeah. um, How to deal with <laughs> tolerance? Like you, you, did, yeah, to, to, you have to be tolerant of fuckwits. Like there's no so, shortage of them everywhere. I'm, I'm surprised that we had it took this long into the podcast to say that word because <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a, there's a there's a shitload of them, and you know whether you like it or not, you get to the job, you have to deal with them to get the job done. Um, so you know, there's a lot of <laughs> patience. Hey, Legend, and stuff. how are you? Good to see yeah, you. Mate. Exactly. <laughs> Fucking sick job, eh? Such Let's rip in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the beautiful thing was in the last few years. Because you know I'm from I, around Bondi. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was in a very privileged position for the last two years where I just didn't work with any fuckwits. Like, you know, in a spot where I could just work with people I liked and that was very rare, but it was, it was a really nice couple of years. But well earned. Yeah. Well. yeah. You know, you fought hard that. to get there. Matty Hall, shout out. He's such an amazing guy. With him. Um, uh, aesthetics is a big one for me, like learning how to s- make something look not, like, s- and not even make something look like, like a space. Like, yeah, be able to look at something and go, that doesn't, that doesn't look right. Mm, you know? mm, totally. And not just the lighting, but even, I mean, you see it all come together, you know, the way things are set out, the angles that a camera works from, um, how someone's face looks under certain light. All of these things have definitely flowed over into into what we do here at JB's and you can see it even on our social, you know? Yeah. And it's all, it's, it's, it's that combination of like good camera skills, knowing how to look for a nice shot, which you guys do really well. And then obviously setting a, a, a good scene and, um, and a set, which is our gym at the, at, at, for, at the moment, you know? It really is like a set, isn't it? Yeah. Where's the Monte Carlo's at? <laughs> Where's the fucking Kingston's brother? <laughs> the last one for me was, um, which was really a, a, a lesson about how to work with other people, but it's the ability to, so you agree that you're going to do something and that a job is to be done and you agree that someone will be the leader of that because it's just easier to, to let someone do the thinking, which often like say, tease a CEO. So often we'll go, all right, cool. Yep. You come up with the idea, but then um, it's the ability to see ahead the steps of the project timeline. So, you know, mm-hmm. you think about this in the film thing, but the whole film thing when you're a young guy is like looking at the gaffer looking at the best boy trying to predict you are excellent at this paul but trying to predict what they're going to need in a moment what they're going to ask for and then mm-hmm. when they ask for it you've already got it you're like yep it's done it's here and there's like, a game for me yeah you love that I, I was i was, was like not seeing disciplined ahead with it all the time <laughs> but i think that yep. that like if you can if you can have that enthusiasm for completing a task or you know with a group of people or with a team and that you can then sort of, it, it, can, it can bounce around depending on who's leading, but the other people can be picking up the slack and be looking ahead. It just makes your team so efficient. Mm. So true. Um, yeah, I had uh, dependency for that, uh, the, same, the same thing. Because even if there's, for instance, that same example, I, if I come up with an idea, I'm not necessarily the, the best equipped to execute it. Mm. Uh, but, and then it goes into someone else takes over that role and then they, they lead that. And that happens on set all the time. It's very military, the outfit. Even though everyone's wearing cowboy hats and fancy fancy clothes or whatever and jeans and shit, but the actual execution of, of, of the projects that run out, especially the professional ones, are very efficient. Very, yeah. You know? I think a big one for me was, um, was just work ethic. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Like yeah. just got to work hard. Yeah, yeah, when shit hits fan, how to just fucking take action and, <clears throat> and, and put your head down. Not to say no. To work, like when, you know, someone needs to pull out of a class or something, just, yep, I'm there. Like that that attitude, that work ethic, it, it's derived from film. And if you don't have so that, true. you don't survive in that industry. And I think we've had that from the beginning since we started working together mm. here at the gym and just having mm. each other's backs the whole time. No, no uh, days that we've ever done here have yeah. been as bad as the days that we've done. Never. So Never. that work ethic, so the ability true. to do long days and just be like, just deal with it, that kind of... Yeah, you're only know, going to get a few hours sleep tonight. Fuck. Weekend's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Just got to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and availability. Last lesson from me uh, was the uh, um, routine, the routine. Um, and like any, any pursuit that you have, uh, you know, routine is very powerful. Um, and 
when you don't have routine as well, it's also it's 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 when it's not there, it's uh, it's very hard to progress. And this is more about like me realizing the industry and the lifestyle that it has, and, and me eventually coming and joining you guys and getting out because of the the nature of it. And you're traveling around, and it's lots of fun. And you're working here, then you're working there. There's so little routine going on, and it's very difficult to to do something other than the work consistently outside of work um yeah, and almost impossible it's Im- almost impossible and i that was yeah that was part of the reason why i left and i remember because i started doing jiu-jitsu and was watching all these people progress and and you know i'd be full on you know twice a day for for three weeks and then i'd be gone for like six months and then yeah. i'd come back and just watch these people go once a week and just progress and it was just like this industry doesn't let you learn anything because it just drags you in and it's just Immerses. It, it immerses you. So it's hard to progress with things when when you're in that industry. And I've I think always that had a lot to do with uh, so many suicides in film, you know, just having, like not doing anything else well, like including your family. It's tough to do health. Your health. It's really your, tough to you know, do health in that industry. Sleep. All of yep. these things yep. just fucking suffer. I mean, it makes you, like we said at the other point, it makes you really good at being flexible yep. and malleable and all those sorts of things. Um, but it's hard to do health in that industry. And, um, yeah, I've also referred to the industry as the jealous boyfriend um, that doesn't want you to hang out with anyone else but him. Yeah. You're in it and you do it. And the, when the Why job's have to there. Be a boyfriend? Yeah, it's a bit sexy. Partner. Strange. Sorry, man. Um, <laughs> cool. it's, it's big, hulking, and aggressive, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, you know, it's just – you're in it and it's a cycle and you're always in it and you try to do something else with one of your other friends and it's like, yeah, come and hang out with me. Yeah. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> it's true. It's, all, it's ultimately an unsustainable approach if you wish to have other things in life. Yes. Family, yeah, if, if, yeah. social groups. Yeah. yeah. I'm, there's hobbies. probably, yeah. But if you go, just go, I fucking love this. This is all I want to do. Yeah. It's, it's like, different. cool, you can make that work. But if you've got other th- aspirations, it's... Yeah, but stuff. I think we looked at it and we couldn't really, I mean, I could, you know, there are, there are people in there who are doing exceptional work for sure. Um, but I didn't see a lot of role models for myself looking yeah, 10 same. or 20 years down the track. I thought there's no one here that I really model could model off and go, yeah, I, w- I want to be living his life mm. when I'm that age. I was like, no. Yeah, I was the same actually. And, and the health thing was a big thing. I didn't see many 50, 60 year olds in good, con- uh, actually none that were in uh, like a, a, a healthy state. There were, there's like a couple that were, you know, obviously still training and good practicing. Good shape physically. Good shape, but just too much wear and tear. Yeah. You know? And I remember actually sitting with Rick in the truck and he was driving the truck to a location one day and he turned around to me and he said, you know what, at the very least, this will be you one day, you know. In my, in my role, and he goes, and that's not a bad place to be. And he was, you know, he did very, very well um, financially and he had a great life. But I remember him saying that and thinking, you know what? Well, I, what what's, if that's the least, then, then I want to know what, what life's got, what, what the most it has to offer me. And then when I travelled to Europe, I remember having a chat with one of my friend's fathers and the film industry was everything to me at that stage. It was nothing else because it was like, okay, this was my break from potentially being i don't know fucking mechanic or a fucking drug dealer or something worse um so it was a real it was it was a big opportunity for me and i just thought it was the like the savior apex of Mm. like i know i can make lots of money and everything's going right i remember sitting with my one of my friend's fathers and he said yeah i used to work in film um i was like you know doing props and i said oh why did you leave and he and he turned around he goes you know what there's more to life than making movies. And it just fucking kind of slapped me in the face. And I was like, well, what do you do? And he's like, um, he creates, uh, he, well, he created um, warning signals, like these warning systems to let uh, towns and cities know that there's a tsunami coming. So what he's doing hmm. is saving hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And I just thought, holy shit, you know, like there's a whole nother whole other life out there of important outside. stuff yeah of stuff that I, that's actually important and and this is no you know i don't want to sound like i'm 
you know, the it, whole industry. Yeah, is, I don't want to be like is, is shit. being, you know, being, being an asshole to the industry or anything no, like that. No. But I did get to that point where I was like, you know, what, I want, I, want, I actually want to, I want to offer something, offer something back. Mm. And I didn't feel like I could do it in, in, in that industry. I mean, you could, but you'd be poor forever because you'd be shooting <coughs> little, little sideline docos <laughs> that, that you'd post on YouTube and some people would watch, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, here we are. I know. Changing man, the fucking world. Man, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks for listening today, folks. Mm. And boys, thanks for sharing the film stories. Mate, there there's, was only a few there. God, there's so, there's <laughs> actually, there's, there's, we could totally do a couple of like R-rated episodes around that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> X maybe. Parties. Parties. We didn't even talk about Kevin Spacey. Oh. We'll save that for next time. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope see. you enjoyed it. I hope that gives you a little insight into, I don't know, maybe some of the different shit that we do in our business that you don't see in other ones, other gym ones. Uh, but um, if you enjoyed today's episode, please uh, take a screenshot of it, post on your Instagram stories, tag us up at Jungle Brothers Movement. That's a really cool way for you to help spread the episode to other people. And the more people we get listening, the, the easier it is for us to continue recording. Today, we've actually recorded a video of this as well. So we are going to be posting this onto YouTube. We'll try. All things going well. We'll see. It's probably going to be about a million gigabytes, but let's see if we can deal with that. Thanks for listening. Uh, love you guys. We'll catch you next week. Thanks, gents. Thank Peace. you. See ya.